Okay. Thank you so much, Sikh. Uh, we're here in the in the auditorium. Uh, it, I thought it was. Oh, first. we're oh, doing right. the target. Oh, fantastic. All right. So now we moved here, but. Uh, so okay, that's, that's here great. Well. I'll go ahead and do a virtual introduction so I don't slow anything down, but then I'll join you in person. Absolutely. This is great. Great. My apologies you. for <laughs> a head back to back meeting. So I am here, just not in the right room. <laughs> yeah, I see that you're in, the, in your office. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Well, I'll go ahead and, and get started then. Uh, as I hope most of you know, my name is Sig, Sig Snap, so Program Director for Sustainable Agri-Food Systems at CIMIT. And I think this talk is really at the core of what we are all dedicated to doing. How do we move from reaching numbers, scaling in terms of reaching the millions, which of course is one of our goals, to sustainable transformative change. I think Leonard gave me hints of this at the American Society of Agronomy a number of years ago. So I've been very interested for some years in participatory action research that scales, because they're almost contradictory, right? We want to interact, we want to understand personal stories, interact, support and adaptation locally, then how do we scale out? And then what does that scale out mean? Is it just reaching out to many people? And Leonard Waltrain has been really a pioneer in this space, coming up with practical tools like scaling scan that you can use. And also thinking through things like some must die that others may live. Really scary, but really gets you thinking. In fact, I just used that in our five-day retreat and it really resonated. People kept coming back to it, resisting it, playing with it, feeling that in fact, indeed, we do have to make choices, right? As we scale and some things, there may need to be some fast fail in there. So I want to say again how much, Leonard, your papers have inspired me, your um, work here at CIMIN, and how we look forward to keeping working together in your future adventures. And most of all, uh, you're taking time to think and to mentor others in this very insightful approach to scaling. So over to you, and we are all very much looking forward to what you have to share with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Seek, and uh, thank you so much for these kind words, and uh, I guess I'll see you later for the coffee break. Thank you so much. Uh, so yes, I want to talk about the implications of embracing food system transformation uh, for the CJR. I, over the last seven years, have given quite a few presentations on scaling, so I thought, let me push it a bit to the, to the next level. Uh, just a little bit on me. I'm a civil engineer by training. I don't know if everybody knows it, but when I say so, people always think, what? And so I just, I just put it out there. I should have done this maybe seven years ago when I started. Um, then I worked at ICRISAT in uh, West Africa, and we were working on drip irrigation and other things, superb innovations, much better than what was there, but they didn't scale as much, right? Then I went to, to Germany to work for a consulting uh, firm, and there it was all about the project management. How do you implement projects? How do you work to get things done? But it also showed that we go from project to project to project, right? And then in 2017, seven years ago, I started uh, to work for CIMIT through GIZ to focus only on scaling of innovations. And last year, uh, thanks also to, to Sieg and Paswell, and also especially Eva, uh, I was able to start my PhD uh, to really think about, okay, how can we use systems thinking uh, in our scaling approaches? And yeah, my next endeavor, I'll be moving to the Alliance um, and moving with the whole family to Arusha and Tanzania and exploring a new area of work, uh, digital phenotyping and on-farm breeding, another, another adventure. Just to continue, I think what is interesting about my position is that it's a CIMIT a GIZ supported position, which helps a lot because you're not tied to one project. Uh, you can play an in and outsider role 
then you have a strong link to, to development through the GIZ uh, link. I think one of the first things I did when I, when I joined is to take advantage of this and uh, butterfly around, as we say. So I went to the Nepal office, to the India office, to the Bangladesh office, to the uh, Ethiopia, the Zimbabwe. So I, I really wanted to see and meet you um, to see what scaling actually means for you. Because at that time, it was actually also new to me, right? I also didn't know what scaling was. And then I think another important uh, yeah, pivotal event, as I think in 2019, when I interviewed 36 of, 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 of you colleagues here at CIMIT about scaling and how you use scaling. I think that one hour interaction with, with in, at the individual level, I think also was really, really very important uh, for me. Another thing that I did quite early on, I, I became the co-chair of a scaling community of practice. And that was interesting because you really learn from, from the scaling gurus. And you also see agriculture and CGR in perspective because there's a lot of people on education and health. And, and they are, we were at that time far, far, um, far ahead of us agriculture in terms of scaling and thinking about scaling. So that was really interesting, I think, uh, and that's also one of my recommendations at the end, get out of the bubble sometimes, no? So today I wanna talk first a bit about scaling, uh, then I wanna talk about systems change and transformation, then the, the compromise, I would say, a systems approach to scaling, and then some final or random thoughts. First I had random, then I made it final. Um, so on scaling, so, we are well aware of our, our very strong scaling logic. You discover something, you do a proof of concept, uh, you pilot it, and then you, you scale it, and then you reach the sustainable development goals. And this all comes from a mindset that, okay, what works here also works there. More is, is better. And it's a stepwise logical approach to change happens. It's just a matter of diffusion, right? And it is a very winning argument to donors, policymakers, and ourselves for decades. No? Everybody believes this. This is very logical. It makes sense. No? If you innovate, it gets adopted, it gets scaled, and then we reach a sustainable development goal. So a lot of uh, AR4D, uh, research for development, the whole development world is, is built on this, this idea. No? There are basically two problems there. The first is how to go from pilot to scaling. But there's a second and maybe even more important problem, and that is how do you get from scaling to the sustainable development goals or to sustainable development. I think I've shown this a few times in my, in my life. Uh, the first problem, innovations or pilots, they, they hardly ever scale. Innovations remain in endless cycles of piloting, pilotitis, it's called a disease when you keep on piloting, you never get out of it. Um, they do not scale as fast and as much as anticipated. And it's, it's really across sectors. It's in health, in education, social innovation. It's, it's really everywhere. And uh, they do not stick after initial funding ends. So this is a very nice picture from John Helen, who used to work here. He showed the adoption of uh, soil and water construction, uh, soil and water um, structures in, um, in, in, I think in Honduras it was, or Nicaragua. Or Guatemala, and you show that during the project it goes up, but then after the project ends, it, it actually drastically goes down. No? The other problem, the second black box that I showed, is that scaling doesn't automatically lead to sustainable impact. No? It doesn't always lead to positive development impact, and actually, on the contrary, scaling can sooner or later lead to negative impact. You, this is the, uh, the picture of the um, uh, how do you say, the, the dead zone in the Mexican, in the Gulf of Mexico because of all the agriculture that's going there in, in the river and all the nutrients that come into the water. Uh, scaling is not the same as sustainability. Handing out food is not as, uh, you can do this at scale, but doesn't mean that it's sustainable, right? Um, but also on, on other things, I mean, Cars, we've scaled cars and, and, and fossil fuel so much that it actually now undermines our very existence, right? So scaling is, is not per se good, not on the environment, but also not on people, no? So there are more and more studies coming up and saying, okay, are we scaling technology or are we scaling exclusion? So 
what happened then, there was a really, I think in the last 20 years especially, uh, a more uh, reflection on this. And it started, I would say, in the health sector um, on how to do scaling better. No? And then I think in the, that's in the 2000s, there was the, the going to scale workshop in the CJR. Um, and the science of scaling developed. And basically, there are three things that uh, then started to change or what, what better scaling means. It is more attention to the idea of context is king, that scaling is a, a non-linear process and it, it requires collective action. So it's king. It's on not, we realized more and more that actually the scaling doesn't really depend so much on the qualities of the innovation, but it depends on the context. Where are you going to scale it? With whom? Why? Etc. That determines if something can scale. So this fish can be very comfortable in the bowl, but in the sea, it's a whole different story, right? And this is interesting because it explains why pilots also never fail. It basically means that we also create very nice project conditions where it's very difficult for our innovations to fail because we just make sure that they make it. We, we re replenish the water. We, we, um, we keep the water clean. We make sure that the fish is safe, etc. We do all these kind of things in our projects. So we create, actually, an artificial divide between the real world and our, our, our pilots. That's why pilots never fail and pilots never scale. But, but the first part is also important. Scaling is not a linear process. This is uh, the Dutch uh, queen on her bicycle, and she's very happy. And uh, if you've been to the Netherlands, you can see that uh, men and women, they can do shopping and carry a lot of kids on their bicycle. And this is an analogy with scaling. So what we see is that, for example, if you're an innovator, uh, this automatic uh, it goes a bit automatic, uh, the screen. But anyway, so this is, let's say, a pilot project. And you can do more. You know, you're successful. Great. The bicycle works very well. You can carry more people. But at a point in time, you need to switch vehicles if you want to scale more. You need to move from the grass to the road. You need to get a driver's license, for example. You need to have a very different kind of vehicle. You need to buy that vehicle. And then if you want to continue scaling, you even have to get uh, another investment in a, in a bus or something, right? And you need to get a place in the bus station. You cannot just stop anywhere, everywhere anymore. So along this development, there are different uh, rules and regulations. So the idea here is that whatever happens on a small scale, let's say the bicycle, you cannot just extrapolate to a larger scale. So whatever we did in the pilot project requires very different ways of working than in, uh, at a large scale. So scaling is not a bigger bicycle. And it comes in phases. It's not a linear process. It goes in phases. You need to collect money to get your bigger bicycle or to get your car. And you also need to learn how to drive. You need to have different skills as well, right? And you engage with different actors and collaborators. And last but not least, these are different innovations that come together. You need a different vehicle. You need roads to be there. Um, you need bus stations to be there, etc. So things have to come into place. You know? And this explains a bit why many innovators that we say, okay, we are the innovator, we want to scale, they're often not capable to make these pivots, to make these shifts into the different phasing, different role and different skills that are required. And I think a nice quote from a book, uh, I think uh, Santiago uh, advised me to read it. Uh, no innovation, no matter how life-changing and transformative, prospers until it finds a receptive environment. And we can see that. Uh, there are no silver bullets. This is uh, what we did for the DX initiative. There's a technological innovation, let's say an app or something, but it will not work if there's no phone chargers, if there's no uh, market innovations is there is no policy innovation around let's say data protection if the smartphones are not available if the uh, the app is not designed properly etc no digital literacy cultural innovation do you trust this no so all these kind of innovations need to happen in parallel to that one thing that we maybe tend to focus on right so the other element is this idea of collective understanding and, and collective action. 
it is not so much about us pushing an innovation through, it's really about engaging the, 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 the stakeholders along with us. So you need to have a common understanding of actually what you want to do, a common vision of where we want to go, but then also you need to have collective action, right? So one of the things that, that maybe help here is, is this figure that you probably see across Simit uh, everywhere. I think we did a good job in that. And uh, just shows that there are multiple levels of scaling and, and there's the scaling out. Yeah, that's the multiplication, the extension, the replication, kind of getting our ID out <coughs> to, to people. And this is also the dominant uh, interpretation of scaling. But then you also have another way of scaling, the scaling up, where you change the policies, the ways of collaboration, etc., so that you enable others actually to do the scaling with or, or for you, right? So one and one becomes becomes three. And this is kind of well settled, but the last one, the scaling deep, is still a bit of a, um, um, yeah, needs some more attention. Um, and that's the scaling deep. It's really about shifting the mindset, values, and practices. And then one with your, your corazón, with your heart, then becomes five. And it's, it's the idea that people want that innovation or they, they, they cannot live without it, right? So it is about the, the, the willingness of people, you know, the scaling deep, but also about enabling others to scale along uh, with you. So that, that's what I want to say with the collective action and the collective... Um, collective understanding. No? So, and that, that is being promoted through different kind of tools, these three ideas mostly. No? And I think also within, uh, oh, okay, this is, uh, within Simit we have some nice examples. And maybe I think, especially in the first years when I was here, one of my main jobs was to find some of those examples and highlight them because they're not always very clear or obvious because often people don't report on them because they report on the numbers of scaling. No, I want to scale this and this, but they hardly ever report on, okay, how did we do this or what else are we doing to make sure that we do this in a sustainable way. So this is really the, the result of, of yeah, deep conversations, etc. No, So yeah, the, this figure is here hiding it, but you can see, for example, in the CISA project that they not only look at how much they are scaling, but they're also looking at uh, the private investments in, for example, the technologies, the reapers that they're also um, scaling, right? Or I was involved in Nepal in, in leveraging uh, money from the government in, in mechanization, for example, right? So that, that you're not just looking at what happens in the project, but that you use the knowledge to leverage big monies. But also on the scaling deep, I was very happy to, to find, again, you have to, you have to really look for them, and, and that's, that's an issue. Um, but a really nice example of the Shamba Shape Up is this uh, video, this, uh, television program in uh, East Africa, where I think Sim Lessa already uh, five, five or ten years ago started collaborating with, to bring awareness about uh, conservation agriculture. But also other hidden things uh, that we found also in some other papers is, for example, in Mazagro, there we're doing a lot of uh, training materials. And then one woman decided, well, why don't I also give this to the local uh, TVET institutions, the vocational training institutions? No? So this, these are things that, you know, then strengthen basically that uh, the area where we're scaling. No? So in 2017, when I started, uh, quickly you could see that, that scaling approaches are, are too linear and too focused on the innovator and the innovation. And there's a lot of wrong assumptions on scaling. Everything can scale, everything should scale, everyone can scale, everyone should scale. Scaling is good, it's sustainable, it's the same as transformative. But also, what I said, good examples are, are hidden and they're scattered in projects. So you see, for example, if you visit CISA or uh, several FSI or Mazagra, they're doing some elements very good, some elements they don't pay attention to, and, and the same in other areas. No? So a lot of knowledge was basically in projects and, 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 and really good, but they were not really brought together. Um, and the other finding is that, yeah, these project environments, they don't represent reality. You know, we, we described this in, in, in this paper. But I also realized that this is a very, very big problem, actually. It, 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 it's been there for at least 30 years. People have been saying, OK, um, this scaling is actually not going as, as well as we all think it is. Um, 
but still people are joining the bandwagon and, and, and saying, okay, let's scale this, let's scale this, we're gonna join you, and let's scale, etc. no? And it goes way beyond CJR, no? So I've, I found my new mission after one year in the job and I said, okay, my, my mission is gonna be to find a better way to scale for the, for the public good and shift mindsets on scaling. So that was kind of my new mission in life. And uh, yeah, so one of the first thing I did was to, 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 to kind of operationalize this idea of better scaling, getting it out of the academic papers into something digestible uh, that many people can use. Again, the problem is, 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 is quite big. No, it's not only with scientists, the researchers, it's in the development world. It is uh, with local actors. It's, it's really a, 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 big, um, uh, a big issue. And then the focus was there on collective understanding. So again, we didn't want to have something that was super scientific and academic, etc. We wanted to have something that is accessible uh, in many ways. So it's experience based, it's uh, based uh, in English and French and Spanish and those kind of things, uh, you know, making it easy for people to get into it. Uh, and it focuses on collective action, focuses on collaboration, but also shows the interdependence of uh, the different uh, elements within scaling. And I think one thing which was quite uh, new there is that we focus much more, more importance to the context than on the innovation, which is sometimes difficult to, uh, yeah, to get across, no? So the scaling scan is basically three steps. Uh, you have an innovation, but you put it into context. So you don't say, I want to scale uh, this hermetic bag or something. Yes, Silvanus is sitting here, so I'm just uh, looking at him. Uh, but I want to do this in Guanajuato uh, for women or for whatever. No, so you, you, you add contextual elements to it. And then you look at uh, how does the environment actually um, respond to this kind of innovation? How, how, how favorable is the context? So you don't say, okay, well, oh, the innovation is so great. No, you look at, okay, how great actually is the environment to accept this, um, this innovation through 10 ingredients and then you, you score them and then you have a bit of a quantification of uh, yeah, what the context for scaling actually is. And then uh, the last step is then to look at, okay, well, how do you actually do this? No? So the, the, act, the collective action. And very quickly, we'll see that you know, finance or value chain are actually not that well developed. So we need to collaborate with people in that area. And it's not just about tweaking the innovation, etc. cetera. No? So you, you get a bit of a more understanding of, of how complex the scaling is and that you also really need to look for different capacities and skills and partners to, uh, to support the scaling process. Now I'm at the end <coughs> of my, um, of my tenure here, if I, would, if I can say that. Still, scaling approaches are too linear and too focused on the innovator and innovation. Scaling can change components, uh, but hardly ever changes the larger system. And systems change is actually urgently needed. Even more, transformation is, more, is needed. Why? <clears throat> We're reaching the planetary boundaries, or we've overpassed them already for a large part. Uh, by 2000, uh, 2050, we need to feed 10 billion people, and that's going to be a huge task. It's not possible in doing that in the way that we're doing it today. No? So the sustainable development goals will not be reached. We cannot feed um, 10 billion people. And the food systems are actually the heart of many of the world's problems, malnutrition, climate change, and biodiversity loss. So there's many studies that show, okay, Food systems are really at the core of that. But the CJR signed up for transformation <clears throat> through scaling. We're going to deliver science and innovation to transform all these systems. We're going to do it through scaling. But let's take a bit of a, a step outside now and, and look at actually what it actually is a system. So food, land, or water system, we're talking about complex and wicked systems where multiple components influence each other, leading to autonomous behavior and unpredictable outcomes. You see the difference with the, the linear <coughs> A to B, right? 
these components, <coughs> they, they form a kind of architecture at very different levels. And there are two important levels. They have the structural level, the kind of what holds it all together, the policies, the practices, and the resources. But the foundation for that are actually the mental models, the deeply held beliefs, assumptions, relationships, and power dynamics. That's why you see differences between contexts. You see differences in uh, how policies, practices, and resources are work in, in let's say, uh, countries in Africa or in Asia or in Latin America, because the mental models are different there. And what's interesting about this, the relationship between these components is actually more important than the components themselves. So it's really about the relationships between those. You know? And this is a nice picture, I think, that describes it. We talk a lot about, okay, when we do this, then that will happen. And then in the real world, actually, there are many other uh, dynamics uh, relationships that are there, interdependence, there's feedback loops, there's emergence, there's self-organization, stable dynamism. These are the kind of like the characteristics of systems thinking. So if you talk about systems, it goes well beyond linear A to B. You have to also calculate or, or, or count with these kind of dynamics that are also there. Food systems, they are the food system outcomes result from the behavior of the system. Again, so the system has a behavior. It's a bit of a funny concept, but it, it, it is, it is uh, how you describe it. So we have now done, uh, well, 60 years of intensification and industrialization of our, our food systems, which leads to cheap food, which is great. But if you then combine cheap food with, let's say, we're going more, we don't work on the land anymore, we work in the offices, we don't go with the uh, we don't go with a bike anymore. We go with the car. This all leads then to things like obesity. You know? So obesity comes as a as a, emerges basically from a system uh, of intensification and in industrialization. And yeah, I think gro globally there is a growing and, and an irrefutable recognition that, that food systems need to transform. You know? It's not about, so much about um, doing more better, but you really need to transform. And I think Greta said it nicely, if solutions within the system are so impossible to find, then maybe we should change the system itself. And the kind of transformation, this is the kind of systems change we talk about, is about bringing about lasting change by altering the underlying structures and supporting mechanisms, the policies, the routines, the relationship, the resources, the power structures and value, which make the system operate in a particular way. I'll come with an example later. So this goes a bit <laughs> fluffy sometimes. But it's important to realize, because we signed up for transformation, the transformative change is called for when existing systems, the paradigms, socio-technical regimes, they are fundamentally incapable of enabling sustainable development, or are they cause of the problem? And I think in that light, you can also see what, what Albert, is, um, uh, Albert is saying, or Mr. Einstein, maybe I should say, uh, that you can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. So in that whole food system uh, discussion, the food system transformation, there's also a very big realization that we ourselves caused those problems, right? Um, with the way that we have uh, industrialized and um, made our food systems work the way that they are working now. Another thing on transformation, there are different forms of change. Incremental change, you, you get a bigger caterpillar, uh, doesn't really fundamentally change the architecture or, or the, the being, right? Um, and then there's transformation, where you fundamentally change uh, the functioning of, let's say, caterpillar into a, into a butterfly. No? So it is a very, yeah, often used picture to show what, what transformation is. Just an example. So when we talk, for example, about land degradation, right? If you see it as a linear scaling challenge, you can say, okay, oh, there's a lot of uh, land degraded here. We need to, to fix that. So let's plant a, a lot of trees, right, or, or do some water harvesting, etc. So you see it as a as a kind of like a tame problem, a simple problem from problem to solution, and and this is the solution. But this is what we have been doing for 
decades, right? And this is the result of that. This is the picture of, uh, of Helen again. Uh, let, let's take a different, let's use a system thinking lens to this problem and say, okay, well, the problem, the land degradation, is actually a result of a system working perfectly well. Fantastic. The system is doing this, it's over and over perpetuating this problem. It produces land degradation, and, and, and it is the case. Land is lost 100 times faster than it's built up. So we are in a system that perpetuates land degradation. So if we are scaling, it's like uh, pushing the, the solutions up, up on a hill, no? So let's regard land degradation not as, a, as, 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 the, as the, the problem to be solved, but as a symptom and as an opportunity to look at what actually is going on. So one of the things that we, we use there, this is work with uh, Catholic Relief Service in, in Central America. Um, we use the, the iceberg model, and the iceberg is a very nice, is actually made basically maybe the most basic system thinking tool to, an, to analyze what actually is happening and why things are happening. And again, what I said, the structural element and the mental model element comes back, right? So we see land degradation on the farm and we realize it's actually everywhere. No? And it's been happening for, for years. So it's not only an event, it is a pattern. You see land degradation everywhere. What actually uh, policies or laws or what is actually causing that? No? So underinvestment in R&D, insecure land tenure, this is in Honduras. Policies gave away control over natural resources. And, and, and then that's great. No, often we go there. But why is that actually? And that is because there is a, a mental model, an idea about agriculture that, you know, you just get as much as possible, as fast as possible from the land. And then, you know, you do your other things, right? Then there's the whole rural urban divide. Um, people are re uh, regarding whatever happens in the rural area as kind of like, okay, well, doesn't really concern us. So those are the kind of mental models that make it, make actually underinvestment in R&D and insecure land, it may be, basically makes it logical. No? So you kind of understand now that it's very normal to have land degradation because the structures and the mental models are designed to do that. So if you want to see this now, uh, if you want to address this, the way to address this is to go, let's say you go down the iceberg and then you go up again. So one of the things that, that they did in, in, uh, with CRS in Honduras, they, they, they were Catholic, so they had a big advantage of using the church. So in the churches they used to um, link this social degradation, Honduras is a very poor country, a lot of violence, etc. They said this is very strongly linked to the environmental degradation that you're seeing. And the opportunities that we're basically not seeing in agriculture now. So that led to the development of some youth groups and then some community governments of the land, multi stakeholder platforms. And then you end up with this kind of solution with better yields, water security, et cetera, et cetera. But it comes from an understanding of why it's happening, and it also comes from a, a strong foundation of, of a new willingness and ability to actually maintain it and, and, and to do this, right? One other thing to know about system change is a bit system change theory. The deeper you go in the iceberg, the more leverage you have for change. So they're called leverage points. How can you change something? It's like a lever, right? And um, Donella uh, Meadows, one of the system thinker, yeah, who's, who's kind of started this really in a, in a big way. She said, okay, there are like uh, 12 leverage points and I just summarized them for you. The first block is around the policies, practices, resources and flows. The second is about relationships and power dynamics. And then again, the deepest part of the iceberg, the mental models and the paradigms. No? And you can see, this is where we mostly intervene. So we intervene at this rather visible issues. Ah, there's no policy for this. Ah, the practices are wrong. Ah, the money is going to other things, right? So this is where we mostly intervene, but it's not where we have the most leverage. Relationships and power dynamics. Do we engage there? Do we engage in politics? Not sure. Mental models and paradigms. Also, I think this comes sometimes as a bonus, but we don't maybe, and maybe the people in gender, I think they're the most uh, versed in this. 
but also I think the tendency is that we work very close to what we can see and we don't work on those very strong high leverage points. No? So if you then look at system change, instead of doing this, you can, you can now, let's say, you leverage the system itself and it becomes also easier to scale. No? So that is a bit the idea. And one of the things I would like to convey is that, that uh, so if, if, we, if we say now we're doing transformation of uh, food systems, it is really not the same as what we've been doing in the past. It, it's quite, quite different. No? So the dominant approach to change, I mean, you can read this, but maybe just highlight the, um, yeah, again, the idea that we focused on structural level, the scaling of innovations and policy change. Uh, but we don't focus a lot on the other leverage point, the mental models, relationships, and the power, for example. We tend to address symptoms, and um, we don't tend to address really the root causes of the problems, right? So we, we see a tree, there's a no tree, okay, let's plant a tree, that's, but it's a symptom of a deeper system problem, right? And I think one of the other very important things, and what we also is very clear on scaling, is that we, <clears throat> we fit the innovation or we do the scaling to fit the existing system. So, oh, this is actually not so going um, in this country. Oh, there's no uh, policies on this. Or there's no uh, market for this. Let's scale anyway. We just make it work in that existing system. There's, there's good in that. But if you look at transformation, your purpose is not to scale that innovation as high as possible. Your purpose is to use and innovation or whatever change you can do to modify the, the existing system. Right? So that's a, that's a very big, big, big difference. No? Issues, of course, <coughs> the dominant approaches to change is <coughs> very familiar. It's everywhere. It's firmly embedded in the way we design, implement, evaluate, and reward our interventions. No? This is the system we're in. We are also part of the system. If you then look at transformation, that's complex, no? It's a bit of a misfit, it doesn't really fit with our daily work. So <clears throat> this transformation, food system transformation, requires, which I have to talk about, a double transformation. And that double transformation is the one inside of us, ourselves and our organizations as well. No? So I'm coming to a, to a close and um, I've been now associated with the CGR for, for 20 years. And I would say that the CGR is not going to transform food systems. I think uh, I've been following this for a while. There has been really three decades of, of criticism on, on, on the reductionist linear innovation adoption thinking, but it's still very, 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 very dominant. And uh, I'm writing my thesis and uh, you get sometimes a bit of a dip, no? you're like, oh my God, is it really, can I make this distinction so clear? And then I had a bit of a, a nice experience because in November the uh, SPIA came, the uh, Standing Panel for Impact Assessment. They visited us here and I was there. Three people were there and they showed this figure. The, it's maybe difficult to read. But they show that the benefit of system and assist, the benefit of the CGR is basically the benefit of a person times the number of persons, right? So this is the, the ultimate linear thinking that whatever happens at a personal level, can you can scale that up to the... So it was, I was shocked, but it also the day after it gave me a lot of energy to continue because I realized, oh my goodness, the problem is really big. If we are evaluating or if we say we are successful based on this, so I was fighting there, but uh, I kind of gave up. But, uh, and, and then also in that same month, uh, the system transformation uh, group of the CGR also joined. And, and one of the conclusions was that actually we haven't really dealt with food system transformation at all. We have no, don't really know what it means. There's no practical guidance on it or tools. We don't even we know what actually are the implications for the CGR. So again, that showed, okay, oof, this is really, yeah, really an issue. And it came for me personally at the right time. Uh, it motivated me. Um, 
So we're not going to transform food systems. The idea that we go do good through innovation, I think, is too interwoven in our business model. We also have a business model. Um, the other idea is the apolitical CGR versus highly political food systems. It's all about people, relationships, power dynamics, etc. And there are too many incentives not to change in the food system. No, I mean, I just read this paper by Bene from uh, from Siad that for every sustainable innovation that we bring to the table to the to the fore, the market, McDonald's, for example, produces three to ten times more unsustainable innovations. Right. So it's kind of like a rat race in that in that big food system. Then again, I think nobody can change a food system or transform a food system, not one organization. So I, I, I now take a bit of a biased view on, I think, what our chance is, and a, a biased view in the terms of, I, I try to look at it through the lens of scaling here. Well, there are probably other ways, but I, I look at it through the lens of scaling. So the new technologies and practice, they are still very important catalyzers real or perceived no, for transformation. They motivate people. A solar panel, that's fantastic. No? It, it breathes progress, just like a tractor, it breathes progress. No? So those things, artifacts, are important. So we should continue with that. No? And I think we should look at it, uh, look at scaling from a systems approach to scaling innovations. And we are writing this down in a, in a paper. It um, went through one review, let's see. Um, and this systems approach to scaling, it goes beyond better scaling. I would say better scaling is maybe what we do in the scaling scan, but also in the scaling readiness in the CGIR, where we focus on broader, broader stakeholder participation. We focus more on, on the context, the time needed for scaling. I think that's great. We're doing that well, but we need to go beyond. We need to use systems thinking to understand the problem and the system, its behavior, the leverage point and the purpose. No? And we need to address deeper systemic issues of the problem, root causes, the relationships, the power issues and the mindsets. We, we tend to focus too much on the things that we can see easily. We have to move from projects that make a lot of changes within the project environment, the beneficiaries, etc., maybe the partners, and then they fade it out, to projects that are designed to really change the system. So if you have a project, it changes the direction of the system in a better way. Right? We also have to think about, and, and I think uh, Siki mentioned it already, the idea that not everything should scale up. We should also think about scaling down. We have to think about ex innovation to make space for the new. We did this uh, work with uh, Eva and, and Frederic in looking at, okay, we tend to focus a lot on, on, on scaling up, for example, conservation agriculture. Now we need to experiment with it, then we need to accelerate, we need to institutionalize, etc. But it that scaling doesn't happen in a vacuum. There is a history of hundreds of years of, of innovation and, and technology adoption that we want to actually replace, no? Or do we want to replace it? So we have to also understand that we are, have to downscale whatever is happening in that system now, right? So current practices and help that process as well. So not only think about, oh, more, 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 also think, what do we need less of? And how can we help create less of that so that we create space for innovations and new ways of working. No? We need to use windows of opportunity and tactfully align with the system. Um, the system itself, the food system, is not a machine or something. It's not a stagnant thing. It's moving all the time. It responds to shocks, Russia, Ukraine war. Things change a lot. No. Uh, it's, so you have to also look at windows of opportunity. You have to really read the system and say, okay, where can we align at what time and how can we intervene? So not just say, okay, I want to do my project now because I get my money now or all or, or that, you know, how, how we're doing it now. So you have to kind of align with that kind of system no? or be more aware of that. Um, but yet still use a critical view on scaling and innovation and that there are all the, also other ways that systems can change, no? not only through, through scaling. So the implications for the CGIR, I think Stephen Hawking said it very nicely 20 years ago, the next century will be the age of complexity. And if you look at the development and, and the interest in systems thinking, it's really booming. When I started uh, seven years ago working on scaling, that was the booming thing. 
Um, I see many, many parallels now with scaling, uh, with transformation. Again, also at that time, there was not no guidance, no clarity on what scaling is. And we have the same now, I think, on, on, on transformation. No? So we have to embrace complexity. And we have to reflect much more on why our problems, the food security, poverty, are not yet solved. And how we think change actually happens. No? We, we, everybody kind of assumes that we know how it works, but I think these are really important topics that we need to discuss as a, as a CIMIT, as a CJR. We need to develop capacity and systems thinking. And only in the CRP evaluation of last year, 2021, uh, two years ago, um, it was really stated there, CJR researchers need training in systems science. This is one of the things, also because the, 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 there was some issues with some system thinking, uh, uh, systems, uh, CRPs like Eumetropics and, and the fish one, which really kind of failed. Um, and we have to innovate in the way we work. Uh, there are a lot of tools out there, state-of-the-art tools, root cause analysis, transformative theory of change. Last week I had a discussion within the CJR on the theories of change. And, and I told them, look, there are many other ways to look at the theory of change. There's transformative theory of change, there's other ways to... No, but we, we like this linear way of, of looking at it. And, and I, didn't, I didn't put the text here, but again, it is really very, very strongly embedded in the culture. And, and the willingness to kind of like um, embrace this complexity, yeah, it's, it's sometimes uh, a bit uh, disappointing. No? And of course, evaluation. We also have to build a system around development evaluation, much more dynamic evaluation, where you also look at changes in the system, and not only what change did the project make in the project environment. No? It's about aligning and supporting instead of controlling. And we need to move from this reactive, I think, to proactive relationship vis-a-vis uh, -vis, vis -vis donors as well. This is all, you know, no, no, let me say that later. So I leave you with, <laughs> after seven years, I think we are just published the third edition of the scaling scan. And a lot of the learnings on better scaling are integrated in there. Some a bit more hidden than the others, but the whole learnings around scaling, I think they're, they're, they're all in there. So I think better scaling is possible and it is now, uh, that is also available in that, uh, in that tool. So instead of writing a lot of papers, try to focus on making these lessons available through, through a tool so that you, can, you yourself can kind of come to terms with it. No? Um, we have been developing concepts in, in developing a system scan. Like I said, the, the better scaling is good, but it's not enough. We still need that system bit, the root cause analysis. What, what other leverage points are there? So Eva and I, and, and with some other people, we have been working on, a, on the next tool, the system scan, where we kind of try to understand uh, that system. So then with that, you can tie it up to the scaling scan and you have a rather more comprehensive uh, yeah, uh, view on, on what actually should be scaled and then uh, how to scale that. No? I hope I also rock the boat a little bit sometimes within CIMIT on, on being a bit more self-critical on our work and use a, a more of a systems approaches. And I think I, I benefited from that uh, GIZ CIMIT link where you're kind of inside outside to sometimes uh, rock the boat a bit. Um, uh, and I think I hope I contributed a bit to the art or the craft and the science of scaling. And, and uh, we started a webinar actually last month uh, within the CGR with Nature Plus and Mitigate about actually what actually food system change is and, and can we get serious about transformation. So we just had our first one. You can check out the recording uh, online and we're going to have a few more because this topic is, is really very, very um, urgent and I think it's, it's very, a lot of people are, are kind of <coughs> coming together around this. Final thoughts, we are in the matrix now. <coughs> We know now that whatever that we need to change, we need to work in a different way, but all our systems are geared still in the old system. You get rewarded for this and that. Your monitoring is linear, design is linear, everything that we do is rather in the linear thinking, right? So that's very difficult to marry. So we're in this chaos phase now, but we'll come out of it. We have to be humble to the outside. I think uh, CJR, 
is an important player, but we're also a very small player. No? And if you look at the real food systems transformations that we aspire to, there are many, many interests in there that we may not be so much aware of. No? But I also think we have to be an activist on the inside. No? I think there's still a lot of room to, to improve, especially on the, on, on the way, on, basically on innovating in the way that we work, I think. So I would uh, call everybody up to be sometimes more activistic and, and speak up, and if, uh, if something doesn't feel right, say so, no? And I think we have to keep our, our heads on, the, on prioritizing the, the public good. No? Big thank you to you. Last slides. I had a real opportunity to meet a lot of you uh, live in person in, in very different circumstances. So uh, just a few pictures from that, uh, Africa and, and uh, Asia. This was the SIP team uh, a while ago and I, when I started, one month after I started. And, uh, um, and the great team here in Mexico here, this was last Christmas here, um, the GIZ team. But also this was a personal scaling journey for me in uh, Mexico. I came here uh, alone and excited, etc., with all the, the, um, the mariachis. And then I, 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 I met my wife, we have a family here. And as it goes in Mexico, it also comes with a big family. So yeah, I'm also part of that now. So thank you so much uh, for that uh, on the professional and the personal level. So yeah, thank you so much. So yeah, I don't know if there are questions in the, in the room or in the chat, let me check. No? That's the author. Okay. Okay. I think you have a. All, all the way in the back there. All the way in the back. <laughs> yeah, yes, Leonard. Over, over here. Hi, uh, I, yeah, uh, over here. I see you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to reconcile your, your ideas about scaling and, and scaling always failing and, and systems transformation. So is systems transformation going to be scalable? Uh, I, I, I find that we, the drive to try these linear approaches is impatience and wanting to solve a huge problem in as little time as possible. And maybe that's actually part of the problem in itself. But is systems transformation going to be more scalable? or less or equally unscalable. Yeah, that's a, a bit of a, uh, that's a big challenge. So a lot of the, if, if you look at the system change work that has been going on, it is often very, very local because they go very deep, no? all the relationships and understanding the ins and outs and then kind of, you know, helping people come to new solutions. So it, it is slow. It is very deep because you have to go to those deep leverage points where the mindsets are, the relationships, etc. So in that sense, it is not as scalable. Just maybe the methodology and the different way of approaching it. I think that's that's the scalable part of it. And yeah, we, we are now addicted to uh, fast scaling. Even in, in, uh, in uh, what's it called in Silicon Valley, they call it blitz scaling. No, get as big as fast as possible. But yeah, it it, it looks great. But in the end, you don't change, you don't transform. And I think we are now in an age where we need to transform the food systems and we need to really uh, change the way we work. That said, that's it. If, 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 again, if you look at the whole food system transformation, it's a big, big, big change that needs to happen. I think we're on the good side, no? Because we are promoting sustainable innovations, new things. We're, we're trying to kind of come in into a system, we, we kind of provide options and new ways of thinking about it. So I think there is space for linear scaling, there is space for more innovation, but it has to be embedded within that deeper understanding of how is it gonna change the direction of the system? If it's gonna perpetuate it, are we gonna make a bigger caterpillar? Or are we gonna make destroy the caterpillar because we put too much poison on it? Or are we really, touching those elements that are making the caterpillar into a butterfly, right? And that, that I, was, I sometimes wonder, because I think we, we tend to focus too much on the hammer looking for a nail. We have our solutions ready, but that may not be the pain point that that system has often, right? So, yeah. 
system change, difficult to scale unless you really look at the methodologies behind it. So we are going too fast with scaling often. Yeah. Or oh, in the back there, yes. <laughs> thank you, Leonard, and thank you very much for doing all these uh, recap uh, from all the work that you have done during the six years, and now also the learnings now of what what's next. Uh, what I wanted to ask, and also due to your experience in both, but your GI said Simon. Uh, and from one of your last conclusions, which was to partner with the others, how do you think should be the role of CIMIT CGR in doing these partnerships? Thinking that also, uh, also one of the strengths of CIMIT is this evidence-based, no? But how to do these partnerships and how much to get involved? Yeah, that, that's a, that's a, I think a, a million dollar um, a question. So. The, 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 there's a on the one side the, the whole systems change part is 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 a people thing it's, it's basically we decided that we wanted to have cheap food and that's why we industrialized and, and so we decided that no? so if you want to change that you need a lot of kind of like discussions and collaboration etc but then again the more partners you have the more complicated it gets no so we, i think we we really need to kind of come to a bigger understanding of how change happens and how transformation happens and then say okay well this is how we contributed like you said maybe through evidence or or kind of through new innovations but i think more in a humble way in the sense of okay this is a big big thing no but we can contribute yes but only if it is embedded within other changes and other uh, initiatives that are there so it's really about aligning seeing that window of opportunity seeing that local innovation that is happening don't always come in with new solutions there's a lot of happening there can we listen to that jump onto that and and, and maybe accelerate that you know? so it is it is like i said quite a different way of of working uh, it is much more eco over ego right and that's difficult because again we are in this matrix where we have to prove ourselves we have to show that we are the best etc if it's not for us, then who kind of this this thinking in Simit? No, it's uh, that's not helpful. No, I think. No? Yeah. yeah. Thank you again for this inspiring talk. Uh, I think we're going to definitely encourage everyone <laughs> <laughs> to uh, review it. Uh, I'm wondering what sort of examples you might have. I mean, for my own life, uh, Paulo. Ferrari and the, the whole idea of pedagogy the oppressed and, and how we literally because he literally the literacy of reading the world to read the word he drew his inspiration and as I understand it led to a revolution in, in literacy both in Brazil and also Nicaragua in terms of that was a case of to me action learning and um, changing the system mm -hmm. Uh, not so much using systems analysis, but by train, change from the inside. Yeah. So you, I've always used that as an example of scaling, participatory approaches, but that's sort of simplistic. I'm wondering if there's other examples you have that you can lay out for us. Thank yeah, you. No, I, I think um, I, what I like, for example, this idea of living labs, again, no? I mean, it's a new name for many things that are kind of similar, but we're doing mitigated. I think it's a very nice uh idea again to give power back to the people and see us as resource persons rather than you know the dominant uh and, and and i think that that kind of encapsulates again a lot of the participatory work so the participatory work i think yeah has been really critical but it's been on the periphery right and i think we need to me make that center stage um citizen science i think is also very interesting you know the thousand farms what's going on with jacob that you know it's it's uh, let let we are we are really resource persons and, and kind of get us out of the way of we are the experts and we're going to solve your problem all the way in the north of Benin right no we really have to have to really align much more with what's going on so I think those are are interesting things um, and then I mean a lot I mean my personal experience with Simit has been a lot on the uh, system. Um, uh, farming agronomy etc i have not been involved a lot with the breeding etc but that's of course also very important now, having that those options available different kind of varieties 
So making options available, keeping that diversity open, I think that's that's really critical. So yeah, I think that's it. Oh yeah? On the chat or? Uh, Ah. So uh, the first message here at the chat says about innovation. You are innovating for a respectable for a repeatable context. Not understanding the target context makes an innovation less likely successful. Yes, there are scalable bullets. Those, those that provide value in the actual context of many low income, low asset people with no little interdependencies, it is inappropriate to think that you have to mm -hmm. fix everything until an innovation works. You have to design the innovation so it provides value in the repeatable context of low income, low asset people. About scaling, agree with the scaling up and deep, and that the scaling can. A scaling scan is a useful tool. In recent years, CGIR research teams have learned a lot about scaling. More can be learned. Scaling can be simple and linear or exponential or unsuccessful or complex. Linear or exponential is not necessarily bad. Yeah. So. No, just to respond to that, I think that, that that's great. I mean, uh, that's also, I think, one of my last ideas that okay there's still space within the transformation there's still space for linear scaling you just have to do it on the innovations and and in a way that uh, that i described you know in, in a way of the better scaling so you look for root causes you make sure that the innovation that you're scaling is actually addressing one of those root causes or is one of those leverage points and not just an innovation because you you tend to have it on the shelf so we need to do more root cause analysis, and then and then yeah, we need to scale those kind of things. So that that's, um, but it has to be in that perspective of the transformation. And I see the the second uh, the question. Uh, I'll just it's about tipping points in adoption. So yes, that that's also again that's a very mechanistic way of thinking about adoption. That there are uh, kind of tipping points, and and there is a whole school of thought about that. Sentola, uh, Damon Sentola came up with a book recently. 25%. Roger's model is from 18 to 35%, somewhere in there. And even we in the scanning scan say, okay, get to that kind of level of adoption, and then adoption will, will, uh, will be easier. But again, that reduces adoption to a decision by an individual um, uh, as a yes, no, etc. But if you look at it from a system thinking perspective, yeah, you, you cannot actually quantify that that much. It's really about are, are the conditions for all these other people then also in the same as for those people that have adopted. You know? So there is a lot of um, literature on this, but if you look at it from a systems perspective, you have to really take it with a grain of salt. I think these were the two questions, no? All right. All right. Nice that Mariana was also there. <laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah. Okay. So. Ah, uh, it's eleven o'clock. There's coffee. Uh, where is it? Sasakawa. Oh, nice. Okay. Okay, great. So everybody who is here, otherwise, take, get on the plane, go to the airport, and we'll see you here at 11. And thank you so much. Thank you, Seek, also for your leadership and Passwell, and also Eva. Very much, I really uh, enjoy working with you and making all this, uh, this possible, and the whole team. Spana is a big believer. Thank you. All right. Over and out. Thank you.